into my research. So um, I wanted to tell you a bit about both because um, I'm not very good at talk about talking about my work and my research, so I'm taking this as an opportunity to kind of tell everyone as much as I can. Um, so I've called this interweaving ethnographic and archival resources, and the focus will shift into that in the kind of next section of the presentation. But first I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, craft skills in Yorkshire. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the Phantom's Abbey stonemasons. Then I'm going to focus on one part of the Abbey, which is the Chapter House. And then I'm going to look at crafting quality, which is a bit about decision making on the site. Um, and then I'm going to talk about like my future plans, because this isn't really um, a conclusive study. So I would find using the word conclusion a little misleading. Um, so yeah, I've been the Regional Heritage Skills Coordinator since 2009. Um, and that very much has involved um, working with different groups of craftspeople around the region sometimes on an individual basis, sometimes in groups of people, um, delivering training in lots of different types of ways. We try to do as much sort of hands-on training as we can. Um, and after about two years, I kind of realized that um, 
the work I was doing had um, research potential, I guess. And I'm sure that was partly because I was based in the department. I don't think I would have come up with these ideas if I'd been working in a council or something like that, which is where I came from. Um, so, yeah, so I, then I enrolled as a PhD student in 2011, and since then I've been working part time um, with lots of external partners um, as a conservation professional, I think of myself. And the other half of the time that's fed into my research as a PhD student. I hope you'll probably be able to judge that. So this is just some pictures of the work that we did on Saturday. Um, it was a craft skills training course in Kings Manor. Um, some of you were here. Um, and this is, I, I don't know, I think this is a vaguely innovative pro project. We were doing live site training on a scheduled monument. We had to get consent for it. Um, we've got a range of students, craftspeople, builders, college tutors, um, and really people from across Yorkshire that really just want to find out more about how to um, repair a, a scheduled ancient monument. Um, so we did hot line mixing and we spent quite a lot of time pointing the wall. And those of you that have seen the wall will know that I have to go back and do a bit more brushing off this week. Um, so that's just some of the stuff that I've been doing over the last five years. This is the project that I've got kind of, I love the most. Um, and this is called the Borovec Store in Helmsley. It's a conservation area building, um, but it's obviously not listed or scheduled or anything like that. Um, it's mid-19th century. But the really exciting thing about it is that this summer, um, myself and a group of partners um, planned a project there so that it could be completely repaired by a group of apprentices. There they are in their hard hats. There they are not in their hard hats. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, over six weeks this summer, um, the lads who I work quite closely with um, to place interview find funding for their project. Um, they, they they stripped the roof, you know, they decided which timbers needed needed repairing, which needed replacing. It was very hard to convince them not to replace everything. Um, and we really worked together. And I, I I'm not an archaeologist, but I think this is sort of my field work because I spent um, probably I don't know two and a half days there a week over the summer. Um, it was tiring, very tiring. And 17 year old boys are as bad as you remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that is um, one of my key case studies for my thesis. Um, uh, and I'll tell you a bit, of, well, a bit about how my thesis fits together next, I think. And this is just another training project showing again how my work with the department um, and my work externally links together. Um, this is a project of fountains, actually, that was being done by this stonemason on the right. He's um, repairing the ice houses there. And this, this summer, Jill and I took a group of, um, a mixed group of master students and craft trainee out to fountain to kind of learn together about um, the hot fire mixes that they were using there to do the work. Um, so, yeah, uh, as you can see, I, I get quite involved in craft skills training. Um, I work with lots of different people. And that means that um, I have the privileged position, really, of being able to do quite a qualitative um, study of craft skills and conservation and how the two interact together. Um, the research is very inductive. It's obviously started off um, from an inductive position, having been designed as I was working. And, and it continues to be so. Each of the case studies teach me something different. Um, and it's something that you know, we never have a final end. Um, and so I, I, I'm using to kind of try and structure my ideas a bit more. Um, and um, yeah, well, I'm using a range of ethnographic tools because the, very, the academic side of my study is used is um, comparing the four different types of um, ethnographic tools um, to try and work out which is the best or what the advantages and disadvantages are of using them in the kind of conservation craft environments, if that makes sense. So I'm not sure if I should have shown this or not, but it's something that I showed at my last tap, so I thought I would. Um, and I just wanted to show how, uh, how um, my case studies are working together. So these three research questions are quite important. Um, and I know, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But this is a very important one, trying to find out more about the social reality of being a class person on the conservation side. Um, and I'm, I'm the, each of these case studies, the four case studies, will be researched in a either a qualitative or an archival way, or a combination of both. And the reason that Fountain Valley is such an exciting one is because it's 
um, the way it's been conserved, the fact that it's conserved, you know, throughout the 20th century means that um, I can draw on archive and ethnographic information um, to try and build a picture of what happened there, which also provides a bridge between other case studies. So I hope that what I show today will be as interesting to you as it is to me. So these are the fountains of stone masons. Um, uh, in my, I, I, came, I kind of came across the Fountains Abbey stonemasons working in the region, and I would do lots and lots of, I would talk to lots of different craftspeople and find out what their needs were and what they've been doing and how they got to where they got and all of this stuff, um, and try and encourage them to get training. Um, and, I, and a lot of them mentioned different people that had worked at Fountains, and it became quite apparent that this network of people was still alive and thriving, really, around the country. Um, and the stuff that they did at Fountains, I mean, we all think of Fountains as a very kind of important archaeological centre, and we know that people like John Ashurst worked there and um, tested different ways of conserving things there. But it also became apparent that the stonemasons that were involved in conservation there have also gone on to work in the sector, continue to care for our most important buildings. And I kind of wanted to find out a little bit more about that. So I identified a key informant, which sounds very, very formal. <laughs> Come quite a good friend. Um, and uh, together we, we've been working to try and, um, well, I've been working to try and you know, draw on his brain and um, kind of get some structure around what happened there. I'm still not 100% there because Fountains is a very, very complex site, as you probably all know. And even if I, even though I'm just looking at only the last 100 years, it's still quite hard to get your head around. Um, there's also lots of archival resources. Um, so there's the Viner collection, collection in the West Yorkshire Archive Service, which um, constitutes um, the papers of um, uh, Commander Claire Viner, who owned the site up until 1966. He acquired it um, from a relative, but he did have to buy it um, in about 1923, I think. And he then, uh, he then broke up the estate in 1966, and it passed into the West Yorkshire um, County Council, I think, at that time. Um, so those papers are quite interesting. They refer to some interesting kind of seminal conservation things. Um, then the Ministry of Works records, I haven't even been to London yet. That's why that's in italics. So I've actually, I've, there's some interesting stuff in the Vine Collection and some very interesting stuff in the English Heritage Central Archive in the Archaeology Store in Helmsley. But I've actually got an archival gap at the moment between 19... Um, about 19, well, 1966 to 1983, which is when, when the National Trust acquired the site and the charities start making records quite uh, well, a, a lot more rigorously than they were doing before. Um, so yeah, so this is um, this is just it's wrong, but when I looked into this, I kind of realised that what happened at Fountains had kind of traced what happened in conservation in the UK over the 20th century, and even internationally. So in, in 1913, we, have the, we know we now, after the centenary this year, we all know how important the 1913 Ancient Monument Act was. And Fountains was actually scheduled in 1950. Um, the Civic Community back in 1967, that does seem like a bit of an aside, but I'll explain why I put that later. Um, and it became, well, that's important because the site was actually acquired by the local authority who had an interest in civic community in 66. And um, that was when the site became a guardianship site. Um, but the Ministry of Works had um, offered, uh, offered, there was, a, there was a draft of agreement between the Ministry of Works and the Marcus of Ripon in 1909. Um, about taking the site into a guardianship, but it was never actually, you know, signed. And then we have the World Heritage Protection Centre too, and, and uh, it becomes the World Heritage Site in 1986. So it actually tra traces um, kind of big, cons big national conservation developments. Quite interestingly, and I, and I, and I, and I just think that that um, kind of reinforces why the need to look at the stonemasons' activity there is so important. Um, so there, there are those same dates again, and that's the ownership of the water. So this is just some of the archive stuff I found. This is the draft deed in, in 1909, which, um, which offers to put the site into guardianship, and um, 
there were lots of question marks. Marcus had written, there was lots of things that he didn't like about, um, about what the Ministry of Works were trying to um, do. And a lot of it was about access around the site and how people would access the site and also um, health and safety, you know, if the public, if he was liable, liable for people that hurt themselves while on the site. Um, that was the proposed um, guardianship boundaries, and, and, and so obviously it takes in the majority of the abbey itself, but also um, the access routes. And that was the main access at the time. Um, and it actually doesn't differ too much from the, uh, the World Heritage Site boundaries, the guardianship site boundaries now, which is this dotted line around here. So, yeah. But what it did do was um, it drew the, it caught the attention of um, the owners of the Abbey. Um, and they spent quite a lot of time over the next 10 years trying to get um, people from the Ministry of Works to fountains um, to kind of give their opinion on the condition of the, of the building itself. Um, Frank. Is it Frank? I'm sorry. Sorry, that's so, yeah. So yeah, in, in 1926 there's a condition report, um, and there is there, there's, there's 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 some I don't know, there's a difference of opinion really. It's just a very small difference of opinion between um, the the owners and Ministry of Works and what they see as like good work for the Abbey. Um, and there's a, the, the 1926 report is, is really interesting because it does show that what we would think of now is kind of dangerous. That's what the Abbey looks like to me, anyway. Um, but what I what I found very interesting about all this is that the stonemasons are very, very rarely mentioned. So we know there are stonemasons there, but we think that we don't actually. But we do, I know, um, but they're hardly ever mentioned. And the only I, I trawled this the minor collection in in um, Wyatt. And the only reference I, the only useful reference I can find is, uh, is in the Fountain Valley Settler Society papers, um, which is a research project on its own. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that. But it's, it's from the secretary of the uh, of the of the um, society, and somebody had written to him. An architect has been on a tour of Fountain Abbey, and they've loved it. And they've written to him and said, um, "We want to do some work on the Abbey." And he says, "I need an architect and an archaeologist. Um, the work which we do." On the Abbey, it's done on this divine's instructions, which of course is under the consent and supervision of the Office of Works. And the men that work under the former Mason who is a former employee of the Office of Works. And that's really the only information I can find about the people that work there. Um, because this archive isn't, isn't particularly comprehensive. So I think that's interesting in itself. You know, you've got a 40 year span and there are people working there all the time, and that's the only reference to them. Um, I can't remember where I put that there now. Oh, this is moving forward, that's right. From now on, everything in black is what I found in archive, and everything in red is what I found in through ethnographic research. So, in 1996, there's a report um, which is in English Heritage, uh, English Heritage Centre, and it's just a photograph, a photocopy of a report, and it's not named. Um, it, do, it doesn't really have any of the kind of details that you would expect of a report. It's just a, a list of works that happened um, between 1932 and 1963, I think. Um, and so this, I, I didn't know about the existence of this report until I started doing my ethnographic research with my key informant. And he said to me, there is definitely a report, because he remembered this man, um, Bill Robinson, Robertson, was... Um, uh, a stonemason under the estate um, when it was acquired and became and came under guard, guardianship. And he remembers Bill Robertson spending a year writing a report at the very beginning of his tenure. And I was like, well, can I find this report? And now I'm sure I have, but it's not named or anything. But the fact that it isn't named makes me think it's even more likely to be a stonemason. Um, and I'll show you some excerpts from it in a minute. And it's, the level of detail is quite significant compared to the level of detail that you get in archive. And this is the kind of detail, I mean comparing that, which is your one stonemason or your few stonemasons, this is the kind of detail that you get when, when that I get when I'm speaking to my key informant. So I mean he's only talking about the 70s because he started there in 1969. 
Um, but he said that there were six or seven local masons, um, people coming from Helmsley and all over, because this was the biggest job in the whole of the north of England, um, and then groundsmen and all of that stuff. So now I put this in, well, partly because it compares quite nicely to the one before, but also because um, I find that where some of the things that my key informant tells me, I, I sometimes question, and I think, well, um, can I see that lived experience as truth? But why this is interesting, partly to me, this uh, interweaving of archive and ethno, is because quite often you find that the archive corroborates what the ethnographic resources told you. So this is an excerpt from a piece of paper at the Helmsley archaeology store. Um, and in, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, um, all of the Masons at all of the English homes, <coughs> all of the Ministry of Work site throughout Yorkshire kept these day books and they told you what was in them, what was um, what they were doing every day, you know, where they were, if they were off site, on site. But all of these day books were burnt by English heritage in the nineties, I think. Um, but Helmsley were forgotten about. They were uh, they were that's just an aberration, you know, they still exist. And this is from the Helmsley one. And there's, um, there's some notes in it that um, refer to all of the sites, because obviously every, every, all the sites had that paperwork. And this shows you that Fountains Abbey had more stone masons than anybody else. Well, in fact, there's maybe Helmsley is almost equal. So what my informants told me is proven to be true. So I'm, I'm just, I want to, I'm going to keep referring to stuff like that throughout because. Um, I think it's important that uh, this is seen as like a trustworthy resource, that it isn't just, um, like a, it is a memory, but it, it is also a way of corroborating that memory. So this is the chapter house. Um, and it's in virals. Well, actually, this is the, uh, this is the whole of the Abbey. I hope you're giving this. It's a bit of a mess, but it's just something I've been messing about with. So I thought I'd put it in anyway. It's cool. um, that's the chapter house there. This yellow building, so that's yellow. Um, and I want to talk a bit about that. So this is a, I put this in. This is a photograph. This is clear to me, honestly. This is a photograph taken from here, um, and you can see that this is the east wall of the chapter house. The reason it looks like west is because I flipped this. This, this thing here, so it's in light, so you can see it compared to this. Um, and we're looking over the, the ruins of the Abbot's house at Fountains, and you can see that a lot of the, it's, it's, it's a lot of ruin, isn't it? They're quite small walls, you know, compared to some of the immense impressiveness of some of the, some of the parts of the, of the Abbey, that it doesn't really, that it doesn't really compare as well. Um, This is, and so this is what I found about this in archive and then um, in ethnographic. So in 1929, um, so this is this is this always happens to me. Whenever I do anything on PowerPoint, it always formats differently on here than it does on my own computer. But in 1929, um, the asher is missing and the core is in a good condition. And then um, we know that some of the arch stones have no bond at the back. So one side of this piece of wall um, has ashlar um, connected to the bond, and the other side is just the core. You can't see anything else. Um, and we know that part of the chapter house is leaning. But in 1932, this, this is from the report, Bill Robertson's report, um, well, what I think is Bill Robertson's report. Um, he says, well, we did actually, we, we did some work after that on the chapter house. Because visitors made a habit of walking through puddles to clean their shoes on tombstones in the central chapter house and defacing a number of them. And that kind of level of detail is like typical of the stuff that I get um, when I'm talking to the stonemasons because you have to remember that they're on site all the time throughout the 20th century. And I didn't say that, I meant to say that. For anybody who knows Fountain, this is the mill. And up until about 1994, this was a stonemasons workshop. And um, it was for a good, you know, 60, 70 years. Um, and it, even now it's displayed as partly as a stonemason's workshop. 
And so there's another, there's another element of it, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, a pinnacle. And he says, through the years, this piece of masonry was an attraction to school children for climbing. So obviously, it's not in great condition. Um, and they did, and then he says, work done, breaking grass and something. Um, so you start to see the reasons for why treatment was done when, when you get this like, retrospective look at things. This is it. Sorry, I don't know why they were. I don't know how it says it's supposed to come out. But this is the pinnacle that he's talking about. And then there should have been a picture of the Chapter House wall a little while ago. And that's the pinnacle that's climbed on by um, students. And then I want you to look at this low wall as well. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to refer to that instead. Yeah, so when I first came here, I actually worked on this low wall here. This is obviously my key informant again. And so we're looking like we're talking about now 1969. Um, and he, yeah, he says he worked on this um, on this wall. And he says that he worked under William Robertson. And this doesn't come across here. And this name is important. Dave Sweeney is important. But this doesn't come across. Um, what did he say again? So, yeah, the, the, what doesn't come across here, because I haven't transcribed it yet, is that um, these places, these low walls, where they were allowed to work on those when they first got there because they weren't structurally, um, you know, they couldn't fall, they couldn't fall down. They, 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 they could do the work there because it was seen as easier and a good place to train. And that doesn't come across yet because I haven't transcribed it very well. And so that's the pinnacle. And this is, the, this is another wall. And I want to read, read you a bit of transcription about how this was repaired. Um, and I'm not sure of the date, because um, the person that I'm working with finds it really hard to try and remember when everything occurred. Um, he remembers much better from walking around and talking, to, and talking about other people. Um, but he told me about this. This is the east wall of the chapter house. And we're still in the chapter house. And that's that pinnacle there that the children climbed on. And, these, and the low wall is like here. Yeah. Um, so, now when I first come here, I can't do a Yorkshire accent, so I'm really sorry. I should have paid someone, shouldn't I? That would, been, that would give me a break. Um, when I first come here, this structure wasn't up straight. What's actually happened, it was on the lean like that, so it was leaning right over. Um, he said, you can imagine this leaning across, Sophie, like that. And I'm like, yeah. Um, it had a great metal rail coming up here, coming down, and over here to prop it. And they had to straight, we had to straighten it. So I remember... The first thing they did here, and I think it was Noel Andrews and Dave Sweeney that did it, I'm positive, they put a complete breaking shore up at that side and a complete breaking shore up at this side. And then what they did, they dug a hole here, and he, he, walked, he walked me over to about here, actually, where I'm standing now. Um, they put a hole through here. Can you see where the grass isn't quite growing here? You know, look. Um, and it isn't quite growing here, so there's like two squares here and here. Um, do you know why that is? Um, and I'm like, so it's something to do with what's going on over there. And he says, yes. So that's what we did. We had to dig a hole here and underneath here. There's a metre of concrete under there with a metal rod and an eye in it. And two were done the same on the other side of the wall. And then I can remember, we had to pull it up straight and to give at the other side. So can you imagine that wall being like lifted up straight? Um, I can remember the day we did this. It bloody poured down. We waited all day to wait for these lots to come from London to see it. We stood here, to be stood here for five minutes, and then we pulled it back up, and we put um, concrete with rod going up the inside there, and then we built that back, that wall back, and put slivers in the other side. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine what would happen today? We'd have engineers coming out. Engineers. What do we need engineers for, hey? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then um, he says, and that's it. That's the biggest thing that I have against today. When we went to Helmsley. Um, because this informant helped me on the building in Helmsley that I showed you earlier. When we went to Helmsley with those young lads, didn't we? And I said, yeah. And he says, you've got to give them the opportunity. They've got brains to use it. These people are here because of where they come from. When you've been through a world war and you've been through Malaysia on top of a train, nothing happens, does it? So that's just a little story that um, comes with that portion of the building, which isn't even like, you know, one of the main attractions at, at Fountain. Um, so, yeah. Um, 
I am, when I'm talking um, with my informant, uh, we are thinking about the future as well. We're thinking about contemporary um, situation, conservation and craftsmanship. We're aware that we're, um, you know, kind of living in a time of endemic craft skill shortage. Um, and so that's something that we reflect on as well. And um, that's something that I hope to reflect on as part of my thesis. Um, now this is another part of the site. Yeah. Okay, that doesn't need to be there really, but I just thought it looked a bit like a paper clip, so I put it, I left it there. Um, this is the west wall of the chapter house, and uh, you can see, you see how this, the the, um, the masonry between these two arches is thicker than between these arches. That's because this goes into a different room. I think it's called the parlour. And these three all go into the chapter house, and so opposite that, you've got that, that wall which we just looked at. And so I can remember the. Oh no, sorry, that's. And he says, I can remember working on this block here with VJ Sanderson, and he was another stonemason here, all different types of characters. And he says, I mean, the tower itself, the scaffold was put up, all the work was done, and the scaffold was up for, I think, 13 years. The reason being that there was a big debate over the mullions, the magnesium limestone, where it comes from. There was a big debate over all that. Nothing changes. Um, and they wanted to match the stone. And then he says, and so eventually, Dave Sweeney and me, Dave Sweeney dressed all the stone, and then we pushed it up with the young apprentices. There was no one to tell us, no one here to tell us what to do. We just got on and did it. But he dealt work continually. He reflects on when the apprentices were involved and when it was seen as right for the apprentices to get involved in something, because obviously you don't start them off on the building of Cuba's tower. And that interests me. So um, I called this section Crafting Quality um, because I'm just like in the process of thinking a bit about that and how and when the stonemasons got involved in certain things depending on their different level of experience. So anyone that knows the, the mill I referred to earlier, this is um, part of the display at the mill. Um, I mean, some of these, these are, this is to say, oh, sorry, one thing. This is to say, this is a stonemasonry workshop at one time, and they've got some of the tools in there and stuff like that. Um, and then, I, so I ask him about the apprentices, and I say, well, how many apprentices were there? And he tells me that the first lot that came from York, there were five. And then, I, I'm not sure exactly what date that is, but I, I would think that that's probably um, around 1970. Um, and then another five came, and this time they were local, so that was obviously very important to him. And then after that, they didn't take on five, they just took two, and then another two after that. Um, and again, this is corroborated in the site notes of 1986. So in 1986, we've got... Um, oh, I think I'm not... Oh, no, here we are. One leading mason teaching a stone dressing to... Apprentice Mason. Yeah, that's, not the best, that's not the best excerpt, actually, because there are some that was referred to two. So I, don't, I have no doubt that what he's saying is right. Um, and if anyone does have any doubt, then let me know, because I'm interested. I want, to, I, I want people's opinions on this. This is all quite fresh. Um, and so, again, here, this is, um, this is him talking about something that he... <laughs> this is him talking about something that he was kind of challenged on. So he saw that, that this, was, this was a challenge for the apprentices to, to help alongside two skilled fixer masons. And then this is a challenge um, for the key informant. So now you imagine me, just being made a leading hand. Um, Gilead Beer. So we all, we all, we've all heard of Gilead Beer, the archaeologist who, was, who was, um, kind of oversaw the work at the Abbey between 78 and the mid 80s, I think. Um, so Gilead Beer stood there and Tommy Young stood there and both Tommy were, well he was only a little boat but he could put fear, he only had to look at you and that was enough. And Gilead Beer says, we've got some money to do this Tommy. Oh certainly, says Gilead Beer. Who's going to do it? And he says, King Foreman. And I stood here shivering my boots and he looks at me and he says, right, I've got that photo that, and, and uh, photogrammetry. And he says, yeah, I've got that. I know where every stone goes, I'll expect it to be like that and I want brown pointing. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. That's like that's that's the level of instruction apparently. Um, so yeah, I mean that's intriguing to me because obviously he's a, he's been there for five years. He's just been made a leading hand, and he's um, 
uh, I don't know, been given something that will test him, I think. I don't know for sure, but that's what I think. Um, so, yeah, I can't remember what I'm going to say. So. And then, um, well, no, that's what I was going to say, actually. Uh, you probably didn't notice, but on that, that, that boring chart thing I showed you earlier, one of my research questions is about authority and control. Um, and that's why it's, uh, that it's really intriguing, because um, that it's a very kind of, it seems like a quite a democratic thing. It's the, sto it's the archaeologist making a decision with the stonemason, and then that's it. Um, so I want to delve a bit more into that. I wanted to bring that, because that's a book that's kind of inspired me to think about it this way. Um, he talks a bit about um, he talks a bit about Ruskin, but he also talks a lot about what was going on in the 19th century and how um, all the kind of um, publications about the building world, the builder, the artisan, um, was all it all reflects um, a big debate that was going on in the construction sector about authority and control, um, and the rise of the architect was having a, and things like. Competitive tendering was only brought in in like 1913 or something, um, and and modern technology like prefab and stuff like that, and how that was having a big impact on the construction sector, and it took um, a lot of the decision making away from uh, craftspeople. Um, and so I'm trying to explore that a little bit more and see how the conservation profession um, is part of that really, because the conservation profession is also quite an interesting. Um, I don't think I'm going to talk for a whole hour. Sorry. So this is it. That, this photograph just illustrates that because that's Glyn Coppack, I think, um, and that's Dave Sweeney. So there they are on the scaffold together talking about the Abbey. Um, and that's that's a group of more masons. Oh, this is um, this this mason still works in Yorkshire. He's actually doing that work at Fountains that I showed you earlier. Um, I'll find the others as well. Now this is the guest house, um, and I've only got a little bit to say about the guest house. Um, but on that plan, on the plan of the abbey, it's located between the mill and the abbey itself, so it's kind of a little bit away from um, the main abbey complex. Um, and but it still it still seems very significant the fact that these two guest houses exist and we can read them. And they're seen as like very, very rare in Great Britain. Um, and they also underwent quite a lot of work. But now this, this is interesting to me again, looking at the idea of um, authority, control, communication, and competitive tendering and stuff. Because what we have to remember is that at the latter part of this period, if we're thinking 1966 to 1986 or something along those lines, at the latter part of this period, um, a lot was changing at the Ministry of Works, which had already become the Department of the Environment and was about to become English Heritage. Um, and the, the, the directly employed labour was being squeezed, and that results in the 90s by them being privatised altogether. So there is no directly employed labour at English Heritage anymore, I think I'm right in saying. The death of the night fountain. And so at this point, we start to get. Um, like references to the medium term contractor and different contract construction companies. And they and at the site meetings, from 1984, I should say, the decisions and the progress on site is documented really well. There's like a meeting every month that's minuted and still in English Heritage's um, archive. Um, and they start to talk about the guest house and what's being done. But it does, it does also demonstrate quite a, a, that these meetings, there's always an archaeologist, the superintendent of works, who's based at York in Duncan Place, um, an archaeologist, others. But there's never actually, a, I don't think there's ever a stonemason there. Um, but at this point, they start to think again, I, like thinking again about that work that the um, that craftspeople, that apprentices could work on, and then it, once you became a charge hand, you might just do something else. They're also thinking about that in terms of the medium term contractor. And they say that they shouldn't be working on the top of the nine altars, they shouldn't be working on the name, and they shouldn't be working on the scenario. And if you know fountains, you know that those are like three of the core central parts that seem to make up the abbey. But they say that the works of the East Guest House Gable could be carried out by the medium term contractor, 
because they had achieved quite good standards of pointing on the night to stay outside walls. But then a month later, they say the medium term contracts of work is proceeding poorly. It has nothing to start on these guest houses, and labour that is there is low in numbers and very in quality. So I, that's just interesting to me, thinking about the kind of, I don't know, authority control and um, competitive tendering and kind of se organisational separation between people that make the decisions and the people that do the work. I think that's it. Um, Sorry. Okay, so future work. Um, I have, I'm working with a group of stonemasons in a couple of weeks' time, actually. At, we're going to meet up at Fountains. Um, it's sort of like a reunion type thing. Um, and try and, well, we'll start off inside, but then try and t walk around the site and find out a bit more about how people, like how people learn at Fountains, but also how it's gone on to influence their future careers. Um, I do need to more, do some more digging in that. Helmsley Archive and the Ministry of Works Archive, because I think quite a lot of the photographs that are referred to in the documentation that I've got will be in Helmsley, that's what I'm hoping. And other stuff, like um, my key form refers to things like making plaster casts of lots of the detail on, um, not Cuba's tower, but the other tower, the church, the church tower, I think. Um, and I think all that stuff will be in Helmsley. And then, the other thing that I want to think about, and what I, I was hoping people might be able to help me with today, is like how to present and archive things like this, because um, I don't know a lot about that, um, but I just feel like quite a lot, and I hope I've shown, <laughs> that um, these things are interesting when they're laced together, and having an archive of one and an archive of another isn't really sufficient, um, that we need to think about how we might store these things and be able to access them. Um, together so we can understand um, the resource uh, in a kind of holistic way. And that's it, I think. Thank you. Do anyone have any questions? I'll start off with one and then. Okay. Let me get two challenges. No, I just thought you, you started off saying that you. Um, part of your methodology was going to be comparison of four different graphic tools. Yes. And I just thought you could just take us through those. Okay, they're not all ethnographic. Oh, okay. But the first case study um, is going to be looking at the work of Briarley and William Ainley Limited together. And that's mostly archival. I don't think that, that that's going to date back to about 1920. And I don't think I'm going to be able to do any other graphic research that will um, enhance that, should we say. Um, but it will be interesting. There's lots and lots of papers at the, um, at the Briley Archive in Baldwick. But also, um, I've had a real kind of lucky sh strike, and um, William Ainley Limited actually did some of the work at Fountains Hall in the 1920s. Um, so that all I can find at the moment is building accounts. But I'm hoping that that will you know, just link everything together quite nicely. Um, then there's the fountains, which is kind of mid-century. So I'm looking back over 100 years and bringing things into the present day. So I've got the early 1920s one, then um, fountains, which is sort of mid-century, links the two period, uh, in the period, but also methodologically, because it draws on the archive, but also on um, ethnographic. So I've already undertaken um, some, I don't know if you would call it interview, but I've walked around Fountains Abbey with my key informant. Um, and I suppose it is an interview, really. It's just a really long one. Do you record him? Yeah. Um, no, but I am thinking about doing that for my focus group. So, and then in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to have a focus group of the six. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that some of the information, I hope they'll bounce off each other well and that I'll be able to compare um, you know, what I find with groups compared to what I find with individuals. And then in the present day, um, I've done uh, or conducted um, some semi-structured interviews with um, craftspeople in Yorkshire, um, and then my Borough Store Apprentice Project. I participant observed them for six weeks, and so that's my fourth case study.
I just think they were taking up room and no one thought they would be important. Like the people who did it thought they were doing a good thing. Yeah. I think some of these meeting notes might be shown in the future. You know, some of the stuff from the 80s that I'm drawing on now, I, I would think that some of that might be put in the future. Because you can't keep everything, can you? Well, I suppose now, now, now you can. Yeah. That is true. Um, but the Ministry of Works aren't quite looked at yet. So no. that's, that's the kind of thing I'm looking to really. Oh, really? Really, really frustrating. Mm. And one suspects that actually when they did get rid of quite a few of those later sources, earlier stuff was on the page. And I think I mean, to me one of the really exciting things that you're doing is showing us the value of the kind of archive, which which is probably being seen as just day-to-day -day stuff. Mm. And I think the um, decision making of archival practice of, of, of documenting is a huge area, as I said, and I mean, Minster really obviously looms large in my nightmares. I mean, what, what are we going to do with those digital data? We haven't got a digital data strategy for East End. We haven't got a data strategy between the archive and the stoneyard at all. Mm -hmm. So we've got these, you know, everybody's creating now nightmares. We've got hundreds of thousands of digital images. How do we decide which ones to and then, what's the cost of our kind of digital? Because it's huge. And, um, yeah. Miss, sorry, I'm done. You ready? Okay, well, I was just going to say, I, I think also, so it even goes a little bit like it's some of the stuff that, I, that I'm talking to people about. Um, and I'm, I'm referring a little bit here to Tim Engold, Engold who talks about textilic and architectonic like practices of architecture and um, the fact that like an, an architect's drawing is a concept and some of these class people don't work like that, they work in detail and they, um, the, the report that I found, the craftsperson's report um, from the Viner era, that is supported by drawings but they're incredibly detailed, you know, they're actually stone by stone but there's never a plan, there's never a plan of anything and some of the shoring is drawn and um, and I even think sometimes if we're thinking about trying to record this, this, some of this content of this stuff, like how do you do that just with an image? I'm not sure that you can. I don't know. I, I guess I'll get there. I hope I get there. <laughs> John, sorry. Yeah, there's an interesting parallel here between um, uh, stone masons in this particular case and, and, and I'm thinking of archaeological excavation, where, where again you have in the archives, these people are with the dignity, if you like, that simply are by accident. Mm. And you know, sometimes a, a, a directory of excavation will miss the names of the people in the acknowledgements, but, that, but that's it. And, and it's, it's through ethnography that you start to find out a little bit about who the people who really worked on the sites. And the parallel is with work that uh, Paul Edward has done in his book, Invisible Digits. Okay. He's writing ethnography of archaeological excavation from the you know, 1940s, I guess, is where it would start. Okay. Coming up today, so talking to people who have worked at Fishbowl and the Battlefields and all these other things. And it's only through those conversations with the people who are actually there that you get the sort of the other stories yeah. about the excavations. And, and this, this is a, so it's an observation even for the question. Um, the fact that, for example, on the water excavations, you know, people muck about, they take up the jokes on each other, they do things they shouldn't do, all this kind of stuff. And you, you get that through the ethnography. Um, and it starts to come out through looks like invisible digits. And I did some of the similar great explanations of the boards there, but back to the same extent. So you start to get those alternative stories and what was going on along the surface and so on. And I just wondered if there's any evidence in the stuff you've done. Well, in the past, there's been observation, observation kind of definitely. Playing capital jokes on each other and not being bad. Your labs are healthy. Well, absolutely. I mean, I've had more of my objects filled with expanding foam than I care to mention. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> that would have happened in the past too. Right? Oh, well, I think so, yeah. 
so that's an interview. I haven't done yet, but I think the thing about interviews is they're very good, they are formal, and um, I think also because some, when I conduct interviews, I have a certain like position, you know, as a as a craft, as a as a conservation professional, um, and I do think that I found out more on that participant observation week, that six weeks, than I than I than I have, um, well, about certain things, um, than doing the interviews, and and I think doing with the participant observation. Um, Spending such a long amount of time, it really breaks down barriers. So at first, the lads were quite um, like wary about what they said in front of me. But by the end of it, they weren't at all. They were like, you know, sexist jokes all the way, and they just, they just didn't. It just, you know, I just became. I wasn't really one of them, but you know, they had no problem with me being a labourer. They'd like give me work, and it was good. And I'm hoping. Well, I, I don't know really. I'm, I, I know that the focus group um, in a couple of weeks' time will be a totally different dynamic. But I'm hoping that by having six of them there together, like reminiscing together, that maybe I'll get closer to that. Um, and maybe I'll ask them about past projects. Maybe that'll be a good way in. So yeah. That vision of the basic the basic tools of a union. I was thinking about it can be that they you get that bouncing off each other rather than you. Having to be the person prompting mm. and asking the questions, so it would be. But it's also that kind of memory. It'd be interesting to see that rose tinted versus kind of harsh reality. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, I hope that I want to see if they bounce off the monument. I know it sounds stupid, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean. I know there's someone here from Manchester, and I've also been quite, uh, you know, taken with what Shard Jones wrote about uh, the inalienable relationship, and so that's something I think I can test here. And in a, in a way, I tested it at the Borobeck store because by the end of it, the lads had it as their Facebook profile. And I mean, I know that doesn't mean much, but it means something, doesn't it? So, yeah, they had it as their, you know, their wallpaper. Well, one of them did. <laughs> one of them doesn't know how to set wallpaper. Sorry. Okay. Um, and I just thought, um, so you got this focus group up and um, I should give you a little warning. Okay, um, yeah. We were told um, by the Department of Trainers in the Ministry Society that the only people in the room together who were only seen at the same time can very much alter the way that they remember things. Okay. So just working up to that in. Okay. So, um, you can there are ways that you can um, create a dynamic um, if you're doing a recording and you use a microphone and you can talk to the microphone to each other and that's just quite cool and sometimes you can make a joke of it and you know put a spoon in that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you find that some people get better than other people and you have to one thing I would say is just don't rely on that completely that focus group um, or maybe organise several um, with certain different people just so that you can get the story because it just it can strange things. Okay, no, <laughs> and thank you. Every process is just a part of the process. We've done that with the whole history, the local history, and the problem is we suddenly get three conversations happening at the same time because the, the conversation you asked the question about, and then suddenly two people in the corner saying, Do you remember when that bomber came down? And you were, you know, you're like, we're having it, that's really interesting, let's just move further. So it's controlling. That's mm. the technique about giving the microphone, which one can work really well for getting clear memories focused on what you want to know, but it sometimes stops that dynamic from happening as well. But I think it's really just trying. Well, I was wondering about videoing it. I just said, let me alter the dynamic yeah. screen so people forget. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And they're still, they're, they're, they're still going to have the balance. It's going to be two researchers and six stone masons, so they're going to have the balance. Mm. But I've got to think about that quite quickly. But I think videoing it might be the way to go. I don't? Best of luck. Thanks. <laughs> I'm really scared. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been doing very much. And I was also wondering um, whether you could um, tell us a little bit more about the dynamics of the major masons. Yeah, I think I do find it 
a bit challenging. Um, because why do I find it challenging? It's difficult. I've only actually interviewed one mason from Fountains. Um, and it was a long interview that took place over two days. Um, I've probably got about, I don't know, three hours of recording and then some stuff I didn't even record. So it was a long, long interview. Um, and I, I did find it challenging because um, they're sort of experts in the subjects I'm interviewing them on and um, I find it hard to like keep up with them, if you know what I mean. So I find it hard to ask questions quickly because they're already like three steps ahead of me. Um, so yeah, I do, I, I, I do find it challenging. But I think because I'm, I'm hoping anyway that my relationship with my key informant um, will be advantageous in that I can go away, analyse the data, you know, get my head around it, which is what this is kind of, you know, looking at the guest house. Um, not the guest house, sorry, the chapel. I can go back to him and say, you know, is this, that with the factual stuff, I can say, is this how you remember it? Um, one other thing, I just find it enjoyable. Like, I really like helping him read Levin's memories because um, they just had a ball. Like, he said, it's the best time of his life, and, you know, it was absolutely brilliant and all of that stuff. So, yeah, I just really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, you said that you were placing quite a lot of um, I don't know, interest on finding that the archival stuff corroborated with um, the ethnographic stuff. But I was just wondering if you found any ethnographic stuff that didn't agree with it, and therefore how are you dealing with the stuff that doesn't necessarily agree with the archives? I haven't done yet. I'm, I'm sure I will. And it's probably because I'm looking for stuff that does like tie up. I'm like, right, I've got to prove it. Um, and I'm not sure how how I'll, I'm not sure how I'll deal with it. I guess it will depend on what doesn't what doesn't tally. Like if it's a date, then and it's out by a couple of years, and I don't think that's, that might not be a very important thing. Um, but there might be something different, like. If, Okay. Um, and I, you know, I kind of think, could that possibly work? And what actually, what did go on? But I didn't find anything archival to kind of set against it. I don't know. But then maybe in the ministry, maybe in the ministry of what work. Date, it? I think I don't, I don't know for sure that. I think that was probably about 1973 or 1985. So they were digging, they were digging. Holes on either side, and then they were, they were doing well to right through the foundations. No, I think they had like, um, oh, I, I think they had like a pulley system that they really, that, that they, oh. so they had like long wires to concrete blocks on either side, and they shored it, and then they kind of shifted it upwards. But I was amazed. That's what I said. I was like, I was like, right. Well, Could they you know. do that because it was set in just a little bit? I don't know. That sounds like one of those half remembered. Did it like this, but actually how their structure could that work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, I, don't, I yeah. I, I found that I found that quite hard to read as well. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see this document. Well, if any of the other guys remember it as well. I don't think they would. Actually, no, I think one of these ones would have been there, yeah. Yeah, get another version of that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be a good start. You'd be told what went on in 1984 after the fire. Mm -hmm. Even by people who weren't there because they were told about it as part of their apprenticeship and initiation into the way that things were done. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that might, yeah. Just have to take that. I just have to remember to be objective, don't I? Because I've got a real kind of, I want to believe. <laughs> Yeah, you talked about that, and then you just mentioned guys. And uh, uh, is it all male as well? And it's not uh, not all, but mostly. But there are some um, female masons at the midst now. Yeah, but, but in the past, because I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. The, in the past. The, another parallel back with excavation again. Graham Clark's excavations at Star Car in the fifties, for example. There were women there. Right. Tim Shadow Hall tried to do an ethnography of the excavation team. Back in the 1950s, the original excavations, and he was completely unable to trace the women. Really? Because presumably they changed names and, and so on. Yeah. The men were much easier to, to track back and, and contact. He couldn't trace the, the, the females at all. And I just sure. wonder if there's any, if there's any mm -hmm. others back here as well that there are the women who just who were just unable to contact. Them. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think it was men. I think it was a man. 